All right, good evening, team. Good evening. Glad you are here. Um, there's an ebb and flow throughout the semester, and the Rangers are playing tonight, so it's, it's thinned out a little bit. Um, really hope that uh, you've continued to find this as an incredible resource uh, for you and the development of us as a church. Um, one of the things I'm going to be talking about in a few weeks is uh, where do we go from here as a church? And so just to tease that a little bit, um, I, I, I think the Lord is, is going to be calling uh, some of you in this room to continue on in further studies and take some next steps um, in terms of uh, rolling up your sleeves and uh, getting more equipped uh, to, uh, to do some of this biblical counseling and a lot of the stuff that we're walking through. So that's, that's the little teaser for you. Tonight, Tim and Elaine promised to stomp all over our toes uh, because we are talking about resolving conflict. Okay, so get ready. I'm going to pray for us and then we will jump into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and the truthfulness of your name and the way that you change everything. Uh, Father, you give us perspective on life uh, and the reason you call us to, to deal with issues uh, in such a deep way is because you actually want to set us free. Uh, we hide in our sin, we hide in our confusion, uh, but you call us forward because you know that there's victory on the other side. And so, uh, Father, we give you the freedom right now in Jesus' name. We pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us and convict us of the need for conflict resolution in our lives. Because we know if you convict us, Holy Spirit, you will heal us as you provide the strength and the ability to grow and to get better at this. And we trust you. We say that right now in our hearts. We trust you uh, with the deep things of our soul that you want to provide healing and freedom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. Good evening. Tim decided to let me talk to you again. <laughs> Just kidding. I usually bail on him when it's a tough subject. I make him carry it. This one's an easy one tonight, right? <laughs> um, so tonight, we want to understand conflict and how to resolve it. So before we can resolve a conflict in a productive manner, we want to understand what conflict is. Now, I know you guys know what a conflict is, but I think it's important to unpack it just to get real um, into the minutia of it. So the American Heritage Dictionary says that a conflict is disharmony between two opposing persons, ideas, or interests. It's a clash. So remember that. It's a clash, because we're going to talk about that again later. A conflict can be a difference in opinion uh, or purpose that frustrates someone's goals or desires. So as we see, conflict can be productive in a relationship, but it can also be sinful. And sinful conflicts contradict God's desire for unity. Paul, the apostle, instructed the Ephesians believers, the Ephesians, Ephesian believers um, in Ephesians 4 3 to make every effort, I'm going to say that again, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And to the Romans, he wrote in Romans 12 18, if it is possible, I'm going to say that again, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So with terms like make every effort and if it is possible, Paul's implying that if not every conflict will be resolved. 
So conflict can be good and beneficial. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. The word sharpen means fierce or severe. I always think of sharpening my lawnmower blade with a grinding wheel. It's like it is a very intense encounter. Uh, and that's the word that's being used in, in Proverbs 27, 17. It says that it sharpens the countenance of a friend. And the, that word countenance means the way that a person is presented. So somehow fierce interaction between friends makes a person better, makes him look better, be presented as a better human being. So in that sense, conflict is good and beneficial to us. It is also inevitable. You can't avoid conflict, even though you might want to, simply because we are designed to be different. And because of those differences, we clash. And so Paul paints the beauty of the body of Christ and its diversity here in 1 Corinthians 12. In verse 18, he says, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. Very intentional. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So here Paul's giving a very clear description of differences uh, that tend to want to get rid of each other, right? So he's, he's basically saying you're part of one another. So when you don't look like another part of the body and you feel like, you know what? I don't really need you. Paul says that's a mistake because we actually do need that person who is different from us. And maybe even the person who's sharpening us and with an intense uh <clears throat> Experience where you feel like, you know, I just don't like being around that person. Like every time, I just don't like the way she says things. But it, whatever it is, it's like coming against you. It's rubbing off some rough edges. This is very holy. It's a very beneficial, God-given interaction when the body of Christ, no different, becomes one and learns to respect those differences and maintain that sense of unity that we read about here in Ephesians. Also, conflicts in relationships are normal. Uh, I want you to picture a husband and wife, and bride and groom, on their wedding day, standing on a platform. Now, this I did this drawing, so it is not professional, as you can see. <laughs> but imagine that this is a platform that's like three feet high, I don't know, 12, 20 feet wide, and under this couple's feet are many, 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 many conflicts. They don't know it yet, but there are so many differences in the two of them that when they get married and start living life up close and personal, these differences will begin to emerge. And as they emerge, they, we call those conflicts. And if they're not expecting those conflicts to emerge, they might think something's wrong. It shouldn't be this way. Maybe I married the wrong person. But the fact is, all of those conflicts were present on the day they married, those differences, but they, had, they just had not emerged yet. So in every relationship we have, those conflicts are present. Now, some of those things don't really create problems. We live with conflict all the time, but some conflicts create that clash, and then we have to deal with that. And conflicts are necessary for change to occur. Um, let's think about when you have a conflict, you have a confrontation, um, that produces change. Think about women's rights or the civil rights movement or any great change that has taken place. Um, it had to be confronted. The issue had to be confronted. So when we talk about conflicts, we realize that it conflicts facilitate confrontation that can lead to those changes. So when we talk about suffering, we recently we talked about suffering and we concluded 
that God uses difficulties in our lives to conform us into the image of Christ. And we um, looked at Romans 8, 29, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I just want you to look at the, the phrase, all things, and think about everything that happens in our lives, how God uses it to conform us into his image. So we've established that conflicts are inevitable and that they can be used by God for our good. So let's look um, at four general responses to conflict. We talked a little bit about this in our anger class, but let's look at it again. We want to add a little bit to it. First is the fight response. And of course, that's a verbal attack, or maybe it turns into revenge, and then you might end up taking someone to court. And in, in the worst extreme, some people even commit murder. And, or there could be the flight response, which is avoidance, denial, uh, temporary relief, and then possibly uh, could lead to suicide. Here's another one, the freeze response. Um, this is fear that can paralyze a person into taking no action at all. So a lot of people, when confronted, just freeze up. So instead of fighting or flighting, they just disengage. The best response to conflict is to foster harmony. That means to work towards reconciliation and work towards growth. So we see that it takes a clash often, a clash of uh, ideas, a clash of opinions, a clash of purpose, all of these things that we know exist in the human race because of our humanity. We know there's going to be a clash. So we need to ask, how does God want to use conflict to make me more like him? Well, one thing that we can do to foster harmony is to keep the issue in focus. Oftentimes, this is not what we do. We get focused on winning, and we don't want to lose. We want our point to be made. And this is not faking peace. Uh, fostering growth is not making peace. Uh, a lot of people make peace an idol and will do anything to keep the peace. And we put all kinds of things under the rug, in the back closet, in the deep recesses of our hearts because we just want peace. And when we do that, we're elevating peace above what is most important. Uh, the other thing is, this is about, fostering growth is about growing through conflict. We want the conflict to have good results. So someone once said, conflict can pave the pathway to intimacy. And in reality, when people do conflict well, when they approach conflict well, their relationship will be more intimate, more connected, that is the goal. And there will be more unity if they press through. A lot of people reach conflict and they run or they fight, flight, all the things. So we want to face conflicts. We don't want to run from them. And we want to do that, if at all possible, for unity's sake. So couples, well, if I'm meeting with a couple, and I've had this happen so many times where they said, we had a horrible fight this week. And I'm thinking, okay, wow. Was, did you have to call the police? Like, what happened? Or like, what is a fight in your home? And uh, like, did you throw things? No, no, we didn't do any of that. We just got into a little verbal spat. And that's the fight. And then other people are like, yeah, we had a, we had a bad, bad time this week. And that, in that case, they did call the police. So you just never know how people tend to, to perceive conflict for them. So I want to give us three levels of conflict that can, that has helped me and, I, and may be helpful to some people to understand that there are different levels of conflict. The first one is just simply disagreement. 
And we disagree on all kinds of things, uh, which that's because we're different. And we can have a disagreement, but have no ill motive. There's no fight. We just disagree. You know? We like different things. Uh, the next level is the argument level. And I think arguments are best understood in the courtroom setting. So if you're sitting in a courtroom and you're observing and two attorneys arguing their case, they're, they're taking the same uh, evidence and they're trying to persuade the jury or the judge to see it their way, right? So they're arguing their point. It may look like they're enemies in the courtroom, but they may be best friends. They may have, have lunch together after uh, court is recessed. That's argument. So I think we have to learn how to argue well. We can argue and there be no ill motive. We're just going through a process to try to reach some understanding or maybe an agreement if we can. Sometimes we can't. But that's a type of conflict. The, the highest level of conflict is what we usually think. It's, a, it's an outright fight. It's a war. Something or someone's going to get hurt when we're in that level of conflict. Now, we're firm believers that if we know how to respect one another's differences, and we know how to argue our opinions well with respect, then we should never have to get to level three of conflict. We should never have to fight one another and hurt one another. However, that tends to happen sometimes. So even if you're in a good relationship and you, you love each other dearly, conflicts can become so intense that they become uh, barriers between you. If you can imagine, look at a conflict as a, uh, a cinder block, you know? And if, if we have a conflict that is not resolved, then it comes between us. If we have another conflict that's not resolved, it's between us. Before long, we have a wall between us. And at some point, we can still com converse, uh, but if that continues, we don't know how to resolve conflict, that wall gets so high, we don't see each other anymore. We just see a problem. I don't see a person, I see a problem. So as we seek peace, we have to know how to resolve these obstacles, these conflicts, when they occur. So that's, uh, that's the three levels of conflict. Now let's talk about where conflicts begin or originate. Uh, one sinner plus no one else equals conflict. That's because you and I are internally conflicted at many times. So if I am conflicted within myself and I don't have peace with God and with myself, I'm going to have a hard time having peace with somebody else because I just don't know. I can't give what I don't have. So if I am conflicted in myself, I'm going to probably have relationship conflicts. So I need to be able to look within. Now, James gives us way too many answers in this passage. But relationship conflicts have their roots in inner and personal conflicts. Here's what James says, chapter 4, verse 13. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they not come from your desires that battle within? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own. Pleasure. So when we are in a conflict with someone, we need to ask ourselves, what is it that I want that I'm not getting? What, what do I want that I'm not getting? Is it respect? Is it uh, honor? Like, what is it that I want from this person? Uh, so James is giving us a lot of insight. There's a lot more in that passage, but we're just, I'm focusing on that one question. What do I want? Now, here's what Paul says about this internal conflict. So I say, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the, the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. So there is an ongoing, when you wake up in the morning, this internal conflict is present. 
is to clash between what you want in your own flesh, the way you think things ought to go, and the way the Holy Spirit thinks things ought to go. And that internal clash is taking place within us. So the best place to start, we'll look at this in a moment, the best, the best place to start in resolving conflict is right here. I need to find out what's going on inside of me that I'm bringing to this relationship. So we know these conflicts emerge in all of our interpersonal relationships. Um, you know, the people who are without conflict probably don't have much of a relationship because it's often that when you're, you're dealing with your feelings and your thoughts and your opinions, which grows you in intimacy, you're going to have conflict. So let's look at some of the con ways conflicts emerge in relationships. I want to talk about uh, offenses, um, or we can call them disagreements, whatever. Uh, maybe disagreements can sometimes become offenses. There are two types of offenses that the New Testament tells us about. The first one is a legitimate offense. If you look at Mark chapter 9 and verse 42, here's an example. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone was hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Here we see the word stumble means offense. That's the original language. And it, it's giving an occasion to fall. An offense is something like a stumbling block. So the picture you might have in your mind to understand a stumbling block, it's like if you're walking down a narrow path and someone places a big boulder in front of you and you can't get around it. It's just a stumbling block. And it causes a huge imposition to you. Or you might picture a child running down the aisle at church and someone just sticks out their foot and trips them. And they just face plant. They're, they've caused a stumbling block for that child. So a legitimate offense is when someone does or says something that legitimately causes you to stumble. We could say that a legitimate offense is when someone sins against another person. Let's look at Matthew 18, verse 15. We find this here. Jesus said, when you are sinned against by a brother, you need to go and tell the person their fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, then you've gained a brother. Now, being sinned against is a legitimate offense. It's, it's something that was done to you intentionally. And sometimes you're sinned against and it's unintentional but it's still a sin against you. Um, the second type of offense we want to talk about is called a perceived offense. Sometimes we simply just choose to take offense. There's that we perceive things to have been offensive. Let's look at this in Mark chapter six, verses one through four. Then he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with, him, with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and his own house. And we see that um, they were offended, but Jesus didn't do anything to offend them. He was just being who he was. So that is a perceived offense. In another scene, we see a perceived offense show up with the Pharisees. In Matthew 15, 7 through 14. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
And in vain they worshipped me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitudes to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. So we see that the Pharisees were offended by the things Jesus said, but Jesus wasn't necessarily saying them to offend. He wasn't sinning against them, but they perceived it as an offense, and probably because they were under conviction. Hopefully, you would think they would be. Um, so hurt feelings may fall into this category of perceived offense. Now there's another type of offense that we like to call an adopted offense. Uh, an adopted offense is the New Testament doesn't really, there's not a sample, but this is what happens when there's an adopted offense. Let's say that someone you love deeply is sinned against or hurt uh, or offended by someone else, and you witness it, and you become very upset and offended by it. But that person gets to go and resolve it with the person who hurt them, and their relationship is restored. But you continue to hold a grudge because of what you witnessed. You may feel it was an injustice or, or whatever it was. And that can be one of the most difficult offenses to resolve because you don't really have a platform to go to that person if the sin wasn't against you. So we need to be um, aware of the different types of offenses. And I can tell you this, once you start thinking about offenses and you ask yourself, is this legitimate? Or is this just perceived? Or have I actually adopted an offense of someone else's? It really gets you to the point where you can start analyzing your own heart and your own motives. All right, so let's get a little more practical. Uh, how do we address an offense? And so the passage Elaine just referred to, Matthew 18, 15, kind of sets a precedent. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you gain your brother. Uh, now, I used to struggle with this because I'm thinking, why do I have to go talk to him about that? He obviously knows what he did. Like, yeah, he knows. <laughs> uh, but in many cases, a person might offend you, and the person really doesn't know they offended you. So Jesus puts the responsibility on the offended to bring up the subject. So I don't know how you would do it. Uh, I would probably do it something like this. I'd probably say, hey, you know, are you aware that when you said that, that was very offensive to me? I, I, I'm trying to get over that, but I'm having a hard time uh, with what you said. And in, hopefully in a good sense where you get the brother back, he would say, oh, wow, I, I, never, I didn't realize I was doing that. I am so sorry I did not wasn't thinking like that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. That's a good outcome of, of a loving confrontation. If you, uh, if you do it well, but see, here's what we tend to do. If you're a fighter and, and somebody offends you, then you're not going to go say, hey, are you aware? You're going to go, boom, right? Because you know they did it on purpose and you, you're judging them and you're just going about it way wrong. So Jesus said, wait a minute, go talk about it with that person alone before you call your friend, before you call anybody else, go talk to that person. Let me just tell you, that is, that is not something that comes natural to us. We would much rather talk to someone else about it. So can you believe? But Jesus is laying that responsibility for peacemaking on the offended. So Here's the thing about um, not going to the person. Because, see, you might want to just pray about it. Say, Lord, open his eyes. 
friends. Show him what he did. So he'll come to me. But but the Lord wants you to grow, right? So if you don't address it, if you don't follow this commandment and go and deal with it, you run the risk of harboring bitterness in your heart. And then something even worse might happen. Not only do you not have a resolved uh, relationship, but now you're bitter and angry. So if, if we mismanage anger, we're setting ourselves up to continue having unresolved conflicts in our relationships. Uh, and that there might be emotional distance, maybe even geographical, physical distance between us. But when we realize we are offended, all right, and we can couch it in this biblical category where, right? oh, oh I, I probably need to go talk to that person. I've got two options at that point. I can nurture my anger and the problem gets worse, or I can choose to follow God's word and actually take a courageous step and go have that conversation. So when we look at a path to resolving a conflict, the very first thing we have to do is choose to resolve the conflict. Now that may seem like a simple step, but it's not for some people. Some people are not willing. Some people don't have enough regard for a relationship. They don't place enough value on a relationship to go through all this trouble. They would rather just say, the foot is not like the hand. I don't need you in my life. Uh, but Jesus is not, he said, no, you need to move in toward that person because this is an opportunity for both of you to grow. So it takes a lot of courage to become willing and to make a choice. I'm going to talk to that person. And if you have made the mistake of talking to somebody else before you talk to that person, then you might want to ask that other person to hold you accountable. So I should have talked to the per person first, but I talked to you. I need you to hold me accountable. Ask me next week, have you talked to this person? Uh, because choosing to resolve a conflict is just that. It is a choice. Love is a choice. Trust is a choice, forgiveness is a choice, and it's it's a, a step we have to take in order to move toward a final resolution. So once you've chosen to confront, the next step in the process is to do your heart work. You have to assess your own heart. So before you go to the other person, you want to make sure you have the right motives in your heart and you've You've done all the work you need to do to present yourself well. Uh, someone once said that the heart is like a finely tuned instrument. Many things in life can cause it to get out of tune. So Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. So we see the importance of the heart. And I think what we do uh, we tend to do is we just react quickly sometimes and we go to people and we're like I want to handle this I want to handle it now this was wrong and we just jump into it and we don't stop and do the hard work the first place we need to look is within so if you confront the other person before you've done this you risk causing a lot more damage because you probably have not even dealt with your anger yet here are a few things that you can do to prepare your heart. Number one, look to God's word. The Bible gives us direction for everything we need in our life. You can search the scripture and find all the biblical principles you need to deal with this offense or this conflict in the best way. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp into my feet and a light to my path. God's word is able to discern the motives of our heart. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So we never want to go into a confrontation without knowing that God has, has showed us what's going on, that he's revealed things in our own heart. 
and he's revealed it through the power of his spirit. Often it's this step that helps us to process and recognize what type of offense we're dealing with and whether or not it's legitimate, whether it's perceived, and whether it's adopted. And many times um, in this place, when we're dealing with our heart, we can actually come to a place with the Lord where he says to us in his word, uh, love covers a multitude of sin. You know, maybe it's a situation where you need to apply grace, and after you've done your hard work, maybe there is no need for confrontation. Maybe you've resolved the offense. So that's the first place to start. So we've gone to God's word, now we'll, we go to prayer, and uh, to Elaine's point, we're not praying, Lord, show this person how wrong they were, open their eyes to how horrible they have treated me, that's not the kind of prayer that's doing heart work. We need to ask the Lord to show us what's going on. So Proverbs 15, 28 says, The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. So our reaction may not be rooted in wisdom or in love if we're not checking ourselves. I love this prayer out of Psalm 139, starting in verse 23. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is a person who is aware that they could have blind spots. They could be misinterpreting what happened. They could be judging this person. So they're aware and they're praying, Lord, see if there's anything in me that's offensive and lead me in the in the way everlasting. Don't leave me in this blindness. Lead me out of this. That's a beautiful, beautiful prayer. So here's some things I could ask myself when I'm preparing my heart uh, to have this conversation with the person who offended me. Number one, am I motivated by love? Why do I want to talk to this person about this? Are the words that I am wanting to use accurate? Do I seek unity with my friend or my spouse, or do I just want to get my point across? Am I seeking God's glory? Am I seeking the best or the benefit of my friend or my spouse? So these are really good ways for us to check our hearts, bring our hearts before the Lord, see if our motives are Christ-like. And after we've done that, sometimes we are still not done. Sometimes we need to seek godly wisdom. We need to talk to another person, have another person give us some input. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you need to go to a professional counselor, but you need to go to somebody who's wise, who's spiritual, who can help you understand and discern uh, your different options. So here, here are a couple of questions that we recommend you ask this person. Uh, how do you think I should handle this situation? Or what would be the right thing to do in this case? How, what, how do you see this? What do you think? And that way you're, you're not just uh, trying to figure it out on your own, but you're humble enough to let someone else uh, put their eyes on it and give you some input. This is the best way to safeguard against making a situation worse. And humility is the key in that um, because the next thing we want to share is a warning that one of the great enemies of preparing our heart and ultimately resolving a conflict can be pride. Pride has to be laid aside and humility has to be embraced and become the priority. Um, Peter cautions us on pride when he writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7, be clothed with humility for God resists or opposes, is against the pride but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he may, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So we need to move from a me perspective, this is about me, to a we perspective, realizing that the other person involved is just as valuable and important to the Lord as we are. 
Um, our brothers and sisters in Christ are not our enemies. Um, you're in this together. We, we tend to forget that. You know, we live in a highly competitive world and we're driven people and we tend to forget sometimes that our brothers and sisters in Christ are part of the body. So if you're hurt, sometimes you will hurt others, but you can be hurting yourself by exemplifying this pride and lifting it up. The other thing is be sure to do a loving confrontation. When we do heart preparation, we have to do self-confrontation. And sometimes I think if we would have the grace toward others that we, or, or even to ourselves that we have for ourselves, that didn't make sense. If we would have the grace for ourselves that we have for others, or we would have the grace for others that we have for ourselves, we would eliminate a lot of the pride that we deal with. Um, Jesus asked a penetrating question in Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5. He said, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but don't consider the beam that is in your eye? Or how will you tell your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and behold, the beam is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, remove the beam out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. And this is a familiar passage to most of us, and we understand the concept, but often we don't take responsibility for our part in the conflict. We don't own it. And so our response is not what it needs to be. So to confront means to come face to face with. I know in the South, we say um, tete a tete. It's a French word for face to face. And, it, you know, sometimes you'll tell a friend, hey, I need some tete a tete. We need to have a face to face. So, you know, it's, it's, you can tell that to your friends and maybe they'll know what you're talking about, maybe not. So here's when we take initiative to love and seek harmony in the relationship. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go, show him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained back your brother. So we see the importance of just dealing with our hearts, going to the Lord in prayer, seeking wise counsel, and making sure pride is not at the forefront of what we're doing, walking in humility and taking responsibility. So... That's when. So let me just piggyback on that because um, on the splendor and the log analogy, if if you say, oh, wow, I've got a log in my own eye, how does this compare to that little thing this person did to me? You may be tempted to say, oh, because I have all these problems, I just probably need to just let that pass. But Jesus is saying, no, you need to deal with your log but you also need to go and talk to this person about that splinter. That's a real splinter. So love compels you to get beyond yourself and to go and love that person. We don't always see loving confrontation as loving, but it really is. It's sometimes what we really need. So let's say, you've, okay, you've gone to the Word of God, you've prayed about it, you've brought your heart before the Lord, and now it's time to make that call or send that text and set up this this conversation. So here's some, some ideas of, of what to do when you get into a conversation. Number one, use specifics and not generalizations. You know, I just realized you always do that. You know, all the time we've been together, you never do this. And I can tell you, I don't know what ladies do, but I know what men do. You never bring me flowers. In 1983, I don't know. <laughs> and so don't say never, right? So we get we get caught up, hook, hook, you know, hung up on the details. So don't use specifics. They don't work. They and they're unnecessary. They create more problems in the conversation. So be very specific. If you're going to, to confront, do it to where the person knows exactly what he or she did, right? Be specific. Also, choose a good time. Uh, you know, if you have been 
trying to pray yourself up to get the courage to finally have this conversation. And, and all of a sudden, you just blurt it out. And it, you're not, the other person's not even aware that you're about to have a conversation. So prepare for that conversation. Make sure you set a time that's convenient for both of you and say, I'd like to talk to you about something. When can we get together? And make sure it's a good time for both of you. If you're married and you're going to do this in your home, uh, don't just interrupt what your spouse is doing and say, we need to talk. Don't do that. Say, hey, when you get a minute, let me know. We, I'd like to talk to you about something. And if that's the wife telling the husband that, he knows he's about to get it. So, <laughs> uh, we need to talk. So make sure you set, set a good time. And then deal with one issue at a time. This is very, very important because what we tend to do is we change the subject. If Elaine wants to bring up an issue with me, my tendency is to want to bring up an issue with her. So if you want to talk about it, like if she says, hey, Tim, you know, you leave your socks on the floor. Can't you pick those up yourself? And I'm like, but my pride is hurt. And I said, well, you know, why do you leave those dishes piled up on the counter like that? Why can't you just wash those sooner? Put those in the dishwasher. So what, I, what I've done is, I, number one, I created a diversion. I got me out of the hot seat. I have uh, changed the subject. Because we're not talking about me anymore. Now we're talking about her. Now, if she takes the bait, this is very important. If she takes the bait and says, what do you mean? Leaving those, I can wash those dishes. Then I'm, I'm free and clear for at least for a little while. Because we're now focusing on her. So we can be very brilliant and sophisticated in these conflicts and defending ourselves. So this is why it's important. We're very clear and we're going to say one issue at a time. Elaine and I have this habit where uh, we call this ping-ponging. You know, we keep, and we never really get anywhere. So uh, she's better at this than I am. And she'll say, uh, can we just stick with my issue right now? Like, if you want to bring up a, that second issue, you can do that later, but can we just talk about my, my issue right now? And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's talk about your issue. So we have to be careful uh, to not change the subject, especially if you're being confronted. The next thing is to choose not to be defensive. So you want to, you want to clarify what the other person is saying if you're being confronted. You want to clarify what the other person is saying without reacting. So it's very good to say, well, here's what I hear you saying. It was offensive to you when I, when I said what I said at that meeting the other night. Yes. Then you can stick with that, even though your mind might be thinking of all the things that other person did. Stick with that issue. Apologize for that. And try to resolve that and make peace. Don't get hung up on the details. You know, you know, that's happened three times. Well, it, it actually happened two times. And there you go again. It was only two. And now you're staying three. You always do that. So you, you can just go down that. You sound like you have experience with this. <laughs> the other helpful thing is that we want to address the issue and not the person. So Tim and I, uh, Tim used to, before all the technology, he would carry an ink pen in all of his shirt pockets. He wouldn't even wear a shirt if it didn't have a pocket because he needed a place for his ink pen. And so we would use his ink pen to help us remember to address the issue. So if we were having a discussion, a conflict, resolving an offense, any one of those things, a fight, an argument, a disagreement, we would use, um, we would try to stick to the issue and not attack the other person. So let's say the issue is the socks on the floor. Okay. Which I rarely do anymore. No worries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we would talk about the issue. And if we would start feeling, like let's say I brought it up and he starts feeling a little defensive. I would take the pen out of his pocket and say, and put it on the table and say, we're talking about the issue. I'm not attacking you. The issue is 
your socks are staying on the floor. And y'all know that's like a minor thing, right? <laughs> but any issue, no matter how big or small, the two of us together need to team up against the issue. And if we went into conflicts with our spouse, with our friends, with our body, the body of Christ, if we went into conflicts realizing that the person is not the problem, the issue that we're dealing with is the problem, and we need to team up against that issue. And we need to choose our words carefully. Proverbs 15, 18 says, think before you speak. We need to be positive, and we need to go into our conflicts expecting the best outcome. Give the other person the benefit of the doubt. Don't judge them or their motives as being evil. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love thinks no evil. So we need to be good-willed toward one another. And then the next step is how to issue forgiveness. And we had an entire class on forgiveness, so we're not going to talk about this much tonight. But we want to encourage you to go back and listen to that class and think about how you can use those principles to resolve a conflict. And we can't underestimate the importance of a good apology and how it should be carried out. So Tim's going to share with you, since he has the most experience with apologizing. I told you, I said, when I die, I'd like for you to put on my headstone, here lies Tim Russo, he was a sorry man. Because <laughs> I have said I'm sorry a lot. In fact, even when I wasn't sorry, I would say I'm sorry. Uh, and I realized that. I, I was much too quick to say I'm sorry. So well, what did you do? I, said, I don't know, but I, I know I'm sorry. <laughs> he was a peace lover. <laughs> Let's get to the So, uh, because some of us have, have never learned how to issue a, a really good apology, I want to give you four things to think about. Uh, number one is to say I was wrong. I was wrong. That's just simple confession. Confess your sins to one another. Uh, but and here's the thing. When you tell the other person that you were wrong, you are not giving them any new information. Because they already know you were wrong. But you, you're, it's good for you to acknowledge it and to say, you know, I want you to know I realized I was wrong when I said that or when I did that. Number two is to convey that you are sorry, meaning you regret saying that. You wished you would not have said it. If you had it to do again, you hope you would do something different. Now, we learned this with our four daughters when they were younger. You know, they'd get into these little spats. And uh, I remember sorting out two of them. And, and so I said, well, you need to go tell your sister you're sorry. So uh, one of them, whom you, some of you know, uh, walked up to her sister and said, I'm sorry. And turned around and walked over. And I looked at Elaine and I said, She's not sorry. We're teaching our children to lie. She's not sorry. So we started saying, you need to go tell your sister that what you did was wrong. Now, we want you to be sorry, but you need to admit that you were wrong. So when we say you're sorry, when you say you're sorry, it needs to be true. Don't say it if it's not true. But if it's true, say it with a heartfelt uh, honesty. Uh, the third Option is uh, the third, third step is to I, I don't want to ever want to hurt you like that again. Now this is not a guarantee. It's it's really not even a promise. It's just sharing the intention of your heart. Like I really am sorry I did that, and I am not okay treating you that way. I don't want to be that man. I don't want to continue to have that in my life. And will you pray for me? And I'm going to be working on that. And if you're really humble. Uh, which we recommend that you would say, hey, if if you see me doing that and I don't catch it, will you bring it to my attention? Because I really do want to change in that area. That's a really good approach. But you're just simply conveying your intentions. And then the fourth step is to ask for forgiveness. And of course, when you do that, you can't demand it. You have to. It's a request that only that person can give you. And the thing that needs to be considered is this person may need time. They may not be able to say, I forgive you immediately. I can't tell you the people that 
uh, and I don't know why it's normally husbands who uh, so I I apologize to her, but she won't forgive me. So well, well, how did you apologize? I just told her I'm sorry if I hurt you. Well, does she know does, that you know how you hurt her? I don't know. But she won't forgive me. She's supposed to forgive me, right, Pastor? But this person may need, may need time. Uh, the other thing is, it's important that we identify the damage we caused. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say that you just bought a brand new car, expensive car, and uh, it's parked right out here. And I say, hey, if it's your car, expensive car. I say, hey, Jason, can I borrow your car? And I say, yeah, I take it. So I go down here, I'm texting and driving. I run in the back of an 18 wheel and throw about $20,000 worth of damage on and so I come back. I know how to apologize. I know all this. And so I say, hey, Jason, can we talk? Uh, I need to apologize. I'm sorry. I was driving your car, and I was texting while I was driving, and I ran into an 18-wheeler. I'm really, really sorry. You know, I, I wish I wouldn't have done it. I regret it. If, I, if you let me borrow your car again, I won't ever. I'm not going to text you. Uh, and I, I don't want to be that kind of driver. In fact, I've already signed up for a defensive driving class. I'm going to be a better driver. Will you forgive me? So that's a really good apology. But let me just ask you, what's on your mind while I'm doing all that talk? The car, right? What? Okay, Tim, that's great. What about the car? What about the damage you caused to my car? Now, it's easier to estimate the damage on a vehicle than it is to estimate the damage in, that you did to another person. But the, if I apologize and I totally skip what's on her mind, the damage, then my apology might be aborted. It may come off as self-serving or, you know, just, I really don't mean it. I just want to get off the hook. But if I am sincerely wanting to reconcile, I'm going to do my best to, to try to at least understand or get a clue about how I injured that person with my, by sinning against them. And if I can talk about the damage, that person's going to have a whole lot easier time forgiving me because they figure, oh, wow, you, do, you realize what you did. Wow, thank you for apologizing for that. So it's very important that we touch uh, or talk about the damage we cause that other person. And then the final step in resolving conflict and reconciling is rebuilding trust. So trust is defined in the American Heritage Dictionary as a firm reliance on the integrity, ability, or character of a person or thing. The last phase of building trust can be the most difficult and it can take the longest amount of time. And sometimes we don't trust because of the other person. He or she hasn't been trustworthy. Uh, we have good reasons for not trusting, and to trust in some cases might be dangerous or unwise. Trust has to be rebuilt, and sometimes we don't trust others because of our own personal issues. Maybe we've had past experiences that have caused us to not trust anyone, or even People who are trustworthy don't feel safe to us. It would, it, they wouldn't be safe to trust. Because trusting is painful, we choose to protect ourselves from ever being hurt again. I believe God wants us to heal. And he wants us to heal and learn to trust again. Sometimes we struggle with trusting God even. When we struggle to trust God, this certainly highlights the problems within. This person may be more sensitive um, to offenses because we don't trust. He or she may be suspicious, looking for reasons not to trust. The Bible has a lot to say about trusting man. Let's look at Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. 
For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out into its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Our trust in the Lord has to be the foundation and the anchor, because people will let us down. Jesus said, offenses will come in Matthew 18, 7 and Luke 17, 1. So if you have difficulty trusting someone, this is very common, and it's common to humans. So we have to approach trusting others with the understanding that they might let us down, and when they do, we'll stand, stand firm on the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. So in relationships, here are a few things to keep in mind. Trust can be destroyed in one event. A major betrayal of trust, like adultery, for example, can, can destroy trust with one blow. Or it can erode over time. Small indiscretions can build up over time to where trust is eroded. And then you realize one day that you no longer trust that friend or that spouse or that family member. One little lie leads to bigger lies and trust is dissolved. Uh, I like to think of trust as a bridge between two people, uh, like a bridge that connects two land masses. And let's say you have four lanes on a bridge. A minor bro uh, breach of trust might, it's like an explosion on one side of the bridge. It may take out a lane. And so, yes, that is damage. That can be repaired. It will require work. But the two people can still traverse back and forth into one another's lives. With major breaches of trust, it's like the entire side of the bridge is, is taken out and there is no back and forth. And so that is a much more severe uh, impact on a relationship. Cannot be rebuilt. Yes, it can. Uh, it's gonna take a lot more time, a lot more effort, and it's gonna really be hard. So if the, the relationship is valuable, then God will make a way uh, because he's the only one who can really unscramble eggs and, and make sense of our messes. So look at trust as a long-term process if, if it's been severely breached. Trusting is a choice, we've already said that, and it is a process that requires time and consistency. The more I cannot put my socks, leave my socks on the floor, the, the more likely Elaine will trust that I won't leave my socks on the floor. But if I say, no, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, and I continue to do it, I'm not going to build any trust with her or anyone else. So let, let's end with this passage out of Philippians 2, starting in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. And it is in specific moments of life that we, we are grappling with what is the path of, of life, of salvation here. I'm trembling. What, I want to do the right thing. I don't want to make this worse. So let us pray and we'll, uh, we'll call it a night, for, at least for this talk. And let, well, I want to pray first. Can we pray? And then, and, and then we can talk. Is that okay? Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, you know every conflict that is in the past that needs to be addressed. You know every present conflict. You know every future conflict. And Lord, will you help us to be, to have the heart posture of the psalmist in 139. Search us. Show us if there's anything in us that is hurtful. Lead us in the path of life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, can we thank Tim and Elaine? So, so good. Thank you, guys. Yeah, there's, um, I think this one hits close to home for all of us, right? Or maybe none of us, right? Nobody in here deals with conflict, right? Marriages never had conflict. 
Um, no relationships. We don't know anybody dealing with conflict, right? So this one, I mean, just as you guys. So I'm glad this was good therapy for you guys just to be able to, to process that with us tonight. We can be accountability for you. Now, this, guys, this one is so good. This is one of those keep this handout close, um, refer to it often, work through it. There was so much content in it that is so, so good. Thank you for that. Like sitting there going through that, I'm thinking of every counseling situation that, that I work through and I'm taking notes like, oh, I need to use that. And then I'm thinking, oh, KK will really want me to use that because um, I need to be better at that. But hey, one thing that I want to highlight that is so important and then we'll, we'll let you guys go a couple minutes early. The part where they were talking, Elaine specifically there in this section was talking about the importance of doing the, the heart preparation before you begin trying to resolve conflict with someone else. You need to really do the work of making sure your heart is in the right place, your motives. I see so many times, and it's been true in my life, and I see it in other people's lives, we want to move toward resolving with someone else before we've ever really dealt with ourselves. And it just, if it, if it seems to have a false sense of it work, right, the issue is still there underlying. And I think that was so important and insightful for you guys to, to bring that out, that don't rush through that process. If you're helping someone, or maybe it's you that's working through that, take the time that you need to deal with anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, all of those things to really work through there so that you are ready then to, to resolve with someone. So thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Um, if you have questions still, right, we've got a, we've got several more weeks, so don't, don't quit thinking. If there's questions you want us to talk about or situations, we're still collecting those. We'll still introduce those and answer those at the right time. So drop us a note, send an email, just write it down, bring that to us, okay? Anything else? All right, well, you guys have a wonderful evening. We'll see you this weekend and back here next Wednesday. Tonight. It's great. Yeah.